Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce, introduce Dodge Billingsley today. Uh, Dodge has a, a job that he's described himself as, as the best job in the world. He gets to uh, make movies about topics he's interested in, travel to interesting places, and um, um, generally uh, pursue uh, interests that he's developed over his lifetime. Um, Dodge Billingsley, uh, after a brief uh, time at BYU, uh, went to Columbia University where he received a, degree, a bachelor's degree in, in peace studies and then made his way to uh, London where he received a, degree, a master's degree in war studies from King's College. Subsequently, he's developed his career as, a, as an independent filmmaker and producer and writer. Um, most recently, he has spent time in China on the Chinese western border with Central Asia, uh, and then returned to Afghanistan shortly after uh, the September 11th uh, tragedies where he was one of the few eyewitnesses uh, to the war there and especially the uprising in uh, Masri Sharif. Uh, Dodge is, uh, has an instinct for going to the right places at the right time and has an insight into covering conflict in the world. His specialty is war studies and he has made documentary movies on Chechnya, uh, in, uh, a documentary entitled uh, immortal Fortress in, inside the Chechen warrior culture, where he's looked at the uh, war in Chechnya, and most recently a documentary on Helen Foster Snow, uh, a witness to the Chinese Revolution. Please welcome Dodge Billingsley. Uh, it's great to be here today. Um, as Eric mentioned, I went to Afghanistan shortly after September 11th. It's funny because Eric and I were actually in Pakistan on the Afghan border with Western China, and we got back about September 3rd or sometime around there. Oh, we've got TV stuff going on here in Islam. Um, but when we came back, September, oddly enough, September 11th was the date I was scheduled to go speak at uh, Fort Leavenworth with the Army uh, there's a think tank there and a command college, and I was going to talk to them about Islamic fundamentalism in the world. And then, obviously, nobody flew anywhere September 11th if you hadn't already taken off, and if you did, you were usually stuck someplace in between. I ended up staying here, and we planned a trip into Afghanistan, and we immediately thought we'd rush over to Pakistan um, and go in that direction. But after sort of looking things over a bit, I felt more comfortable about Uzbekistan because I really believe that Mazari Sharif would be the critical or one of the key cities in the war. And in fact, it did and was the key city. In fact, it was the first major city to fall to Northern Alliance forces, General Rashid Dostum's primary, primarily Uzbek force. Um, unfortunately for me and all the other people who thought that Uzbekistan would also be a good idea or a good place to enter, Afghanistan, the government kept the border closed. So for six weeks we floundered in Uzbekistan waiting for promises of the border to open. We met with Afghan smugglers that were smuggling uh, opium and things through Turkmenistan. We were going to go that direction. And they were actually going to be smuggled into the Taliban first because the Mazar had not uh, fallen yet. And there was some indication by the Taliban that they weren't, they would uh, receive us. Um, Probably because, you know, everybody else was telling the other stories. They thought maybe they might have something to gain. But it turned out that it did, in fact, open up. We got there the day of the uh, Kalajungi fortress turned prison uprising. And you're probably more familiar with the name John Walker, the Taliban who was found, at, came out of the basement four days after the battle ended. And uh, Span, John Michael Span, the CIA operative who was killed, the first KIA in the war in Afghanistan. Before I say anything else, I'm going to show you a 10-minute clip of this. Um, Battle, and then I'll put it into perspective, and we'll talk about that and have some question and answer about some of the larger picture issues. Thanks.
there were 600 Pakistanis in a girls' school in, in the city, and there was a gun battle, and they all died, all of them, which made a lot of people feel, a lot of people felt that General Filson had a, just massacred them because he's got a history of doing that. He killed 3,000 Hazaras when he retook the city in 1997, I think. Just because. And uh, he had a really bad reputation for treachery and uh, wiping his enemies out. So there was this, I, so we arrived two weeks after this. We come down, took a barge across the river, arrived in Mazar, and we hear rumor that uh, there had been an uprising about with these prisoners. And what these, these prisoners had actually come from Kunduz. That was like the last city to fall in the north. Like right there. And they had walked, or gone by bus, to Mazar, and the idea was they were going to be met 10 miles from the city, escorted into this fortress, and then Dostum gave some vague assurances like we're going to then turn them over to the UN. It didn't really make any sense because there is no UN presence in, in Afghanistan. There might be some their subsidiary groups that are delivering food aid, etc., but there's no UN police force, no UN political mechanism, nothing. So who knows exactly what was going to happen. Uh, the U.S. Special Forces were there in a big way because they wanted to know who these guys were. This group happened to be foreign Taliban, and this is problematic because we said going into this war that we're you know, get to the Taliban, we want to fight the Taliban, but our main thing is we want to get to Al-Qaeda and some of these foreigners who will go and export this brand of fundamentalism and this brand of terror to their home countries. This was a, this entire group of prisoners were foreigners, Pakistanis, Yemenis. Ford cars and trucks, including... I don't know, that wasn't me. Uh, <laughs> maybe the mic picked something up. Um, interesting. Anyway, so... This was kind of an interesting situation. Special forces were there to see who these guys were. And I don't know if anyone saw the little shot of uh, Span interviewing Walker, snapping his fingers, why won't you talk to me? You know, I can't help you if you don't talk to me. What happened was, Saturday night, the prisoners are met out on the road. They go into the fortress. The fortress is just a temporary holding space. It's not designed as a prison. It's roughly shaped like this, but yet to find an accurate map of it. Most of the people have got it all wrong. Time Magazine is the closest. I think, to having it right, but um, it's just a fort. It's Dostum's headquarters. It's where he stores a lot of his weapons. Uh, it's where he puts his horses. He's a cavalry. Early on in the war, like in October, they were doing cavalry charges against Taliban. Taliban were in the Toyota pickups, and Dostum was in on horseback. And they, uh, but they were supported by U.S. airstrikes, and they were successful in actually taking the draw as a result. Anyway, they come into the fortress, through a main gate, and there's a dividing wall down the center. They're herded into the southern compound. This is north, south, east, west. That makes sense, Paul? Well, okay. They're brought into the southern compound here, and there's a pink house. You may have noticed that in the video, there's a pink house in the middle there. <laughs> While they're being lined up, one of them de detonates, detonates a grenade, killing himself in the Northern Alliance commander. Another Northern Alliance commander passes through, like 20 minutes later, guy detonates a grenade, suicide bomb, kills himself, and this Northern Alliance commander. So the Northern Alliance, they become a little perturbed about this whole situation. They start tying them up at the elbows and herding them into the basement. There's an underground cell network below the state house. That's where they work Saturday night. Sunday morning, they come back. They start bringing these guys out so they can, like, wash, say their prayers. Some of them are untied. Many are still tied from the night before. There's three guys in the, in the compound. Two CIA agents, Span, and the guy known only as Dave, and then Saeed Kamil, which is Dostum's chief of intelligence, with whom I have had many meetings with in Uzbekistan, because he also was an exile in Uzbekistan and did not return to Afghanistan until it fell two weeks previous. Those three were interrogating prisoners, basically going through the bunch, looking to see who was who, and that's when they pulled Walker out of the line. They heard he spoke English, they had Somehow they knew this. They pull him out. They try to get him to talk. Apparently, according to the video, he doesn't talk. Dave, um, and the only witness is actually Saeed Camille died. His fan was killed. What happened, and no one's really sure on the details, he said, when I was talking to Northern Alliance people the next couple of days, they said his fan walked up to another Northern Alliance, uh, another Taliban, people on the ground. He said, what are you here for? And he got I'm here to kill you. And he lunged this fan. Span pulled out his revolver and he shot him and two others, but he was totally overtaken by a big group and they basically clawed, kicked, and, and bit the guy to death. In the process, some other guys jumped out of the house, detonating grenades as they came, killing Northern Alliance guys around them, picked up the Kalishnikovs, the assault rifles, and just started turning the fire. 
the group, they were all sitting around out here, and you saw that body of field, like right here, just a bunch of bodies, probably about 100 bodies in that field there. Somewhere on that body, on that field, was also close fan. Chaos broke out. Dave grabbed a Kalishnikov from a Northern Alliance soldier who was too stunned to do anything, apparently, and he killed three more, and was able to, and then emptied his service revolver and his LV ammunition in his 30-round uh, clip from his Kalishnikov, and was able to get out of the south end, where he rushed to the main gate. I mean, rushed to this building on the north wall, like the main building of the courtyard there. In the melee, about 40 Northern Alliance guys were killed, like, within 20 minutes. And basically, the entire group of guardians were killed. Dave takes refuge here. At the same time, oddly enough, there's a German TV crew, and the, the Red Cross were there to make sure the prisoners were being well treated. <laughs> and they got caught, too. They all ran to the north building. So what happens is the Taliban is sort of took this area right here. Everybody else retreated back to here. Now the Taliban, they were probably very happy about this. They had no idea how good this luck was at the time. There's a bunch of buildings here. Weapons, storage facilities. When they broke out and they just rushed into all the buildings, they busted through the doors and there was uh, RPGs by the dozens, lots of different rockets, uh, Bangor torpedoes even. Um, Kalishnikovs, 120 millimeter and 80 millimeter mortars. Within 15 minutes, the north wall was, having, was receiving RPG fire and mortar fire. In the video, you see the guy walking and the rocket flies over. Those rockets were flying over us all day long. And um, thank goodness they were going high. Every once in a while, they wouldn't get so high in shrapnel. You know, you really just have to dive down because the shrapnel would go for quite a long way. But an interesting sort of dynamic evolved and the, the Taliban have the south and the northern lines have the high ground on the north and then they position themselves on the outside of the wall to try to make sure the Taliban didn't escape. But they had no power in the, in the southern compound at all. Dave, go, Dave, the CIA guy, loses his communication here if he even had any, and this has been a big debate. The CIA looks like they really, they may have botched this one. I hate to say that because you don't know all the details, but I mean, they sent two guys in, they had no backup, no support. He runs, one guy gets killed. Dave runs to the, the, this area here. He uses the German TV satellite telephone. He doesn't even have a number for the special forces only 10 miles away. The CIA was operating independent of the special forces. So he calls the station chief in the Tashkent Uzbekistan Embassy, who passes him through the CENTCOM command in Florida, who passes him back through the special forces command 10 miles away. He calls and he's like, basically, we have an insurrection here, can't, you know, span, I don't know where he is, I mean, it's like a missing in action thing at this point, they didn't consider him killed yet. Uh, special forces responded, bringing 17 guys in, U.S. Um, and British. They arrived at this main gate here, and they took a com command and control tower here. They set up a position here below the northeast wall, a position here, and a position here. They start orchestrating combat, um, excuse me, they start orchestrating air combat, um, airstrikes against the southern compound, and after nine missiles being fired, they sort of definitely then steal the Taliban, because there was a thing that the, 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 the Taliban would escape take over the fortress or just get out into the countryside. And in fact, the Red Cross haven't published the numbers yet. I'm going to go forward the story. But I think about 200 did escape, and no one's talking about it. Those some, you know, at this point, doesn't want to look any stupid or they already looked. But the numbers don't add up. I only counted about 200 dead, and there's probably maybe 250 dead, maybe 300 dead, because some bodies just blown apart. There's 85 came out of the basement on the last day, but there were as many as 600 in there, which there's just a bunch of missing. There were a few that had gotten out to the sewer pipe. They showed up in the neighborhoods over here. Two were gunned down. It looked like in the heat of battle. The third had a bullet to the forehead. He probably tried to surrender the Northern Lions guys and shot him point blank. He was executed. That Sunday, the first day. At that point, things sort of stabilized. The Taliban are in firm control here. Northern Lions deep up security here. That's it. Monday morning arrived. This is when I came out to the fortress. Monday morning. We had been traveling. and get, We arrived in Bazaar Monday morning. We arrive at this main road, and it's really weird in Afghanistan because you literally just take a taxi. So you just don't want to take a taxi to the port. And the guy says, to the war, to the war. He said, yes, to the war. And he dropped us off right here. <laughs> <laughs> and he sped off. And the second he sped off, a rocket zipped over our head, and it exploded about 35 mar meters behind us. And um, I thought, wow, that's kind of intense. I mean, I thought, it was, I thought literally we'd see an aftermath instead of a battlefield you know, progressing. Another rocket zipped over our head, and then a third rocket zipped over our head, all detonated here. And I didn't understand the layout of the fortress yet, but I wasn't sure what was happening. 
But all I know is my friend from Time Magazine, Alex Perry, and I we traveled together for safety and split tab tops at the war, things like that. <laughs> we were all behind this tree, and we looked so silly because it was a narrow tree, and like I was in front and he was behind because he was a good one, and there were bullets whizzing overhead. And what had happened was, because there was this breach, there was this dividing wall, the Taliban set up their rocket positions here and here to fire through the breach. It gave them a field of fire that went like that. And so they're also aiming high at the wall. If they miss the wall, the trajectory, the arc would drop them, and this became the kill zone. <laughs> this was the most dangerous place to be in the whole battle, I believe, until, you, until it became like you know, clearing room to room and tree to tree at the southern end. We figured that out right away because of all the rocket fire and the bullets, and you can hear the bullets, they sort of crack when they go real close. They come real close, and they were just, it was a steady stream of fire. So we made a, a gash from the tree, ran about 300 yards over this end here, and we were out of the line of fire. And but it was a really strange area. There was so much mortars were dropping. They were they had mortars dropping, and they were also going high and dropping all over the spot here. A couple of journalists um, got strapped on the leg and were hit in this area a day later after we told them not to go to that area and not to try to approach the forces from the north. But uh, they did. And you, it should have been telling. There were no northern lines approaching the forces from this northern kill zone. Everybody approached from the east and from the west. So that's what we did. We went to the east. We crawled up jumped over the wall, got into the northeast tower, and some of that footage you see is from the northeast tower with the tank fire. What had happened was on the first day they positioned the tank here and they positioned the tank down below here. And they were also firing through the same breach. And we stayed up there for about most of the morning, Monday morning, which in the second day of the battle. And there's quite a lot of fire. You saw cases where they were just unloading all their weapons. It doesn't even look like they're aiming. Well, they're not aiming. But they would see they would see Taliban run around here, their windows, and you could see the Taliban. They would run from like you could see them in the windows, or they'd run from building to building, or they'd jump behind a tree. And they're only out for a brief instant, and then all the guns on this tower would just light up, and this sort of carpet, you know, the whole area, thinking or hoping that they would kill the Taliban. There wasn't much close. There wasn't any close quarter engagement at this time. We came down off the wall because we wanted to work our way around to get to the west position to see what was going on. We arrived back at the road just in time to watch the special forces arrive. And they're a very interesting group. They had uh, a mix of British SAS, Green Berets, Delta, some CIA guys, and they had 10th Mountain Division. And up until that point, I hadn't seen any 10th Mountain Division on the ground anywhere in Afghanistan because, you know, they were, they were put in Uzbekistan and they were said to be doing only humanitarian or search and rescue. The 10th Mountain Division was basically the muscle. Special Forces called in the strike. 10th Mountain Division was there in case things got hairy. They were going to be, they were basically going to lay down covering fire and support the Special Forces. They were sort of like an escort service for the Special Forces here. So they, the Special Forces put up a QRF here, quick response force here. They had the lazy team there and box remain position right there. They put a laser on the target through the breach. They wanted to hit the pink house. Um, no one's clear on what happened next, except the bomb hit right here. Oh. And that's what you saw, and that's where we were that whole morning. And the tank we were hiding behind was the tank that was firing, but the tank you saw flipped over, the turret ripped out. That bomb basically hit the point of origination. We're not sure, when I was giving this lecture to the Army a couple weeks ago, we came up with five or six different scenarios as to why it, I mean, it didn't hit in the middle. It didn't just miss. It went down on these guys. But basically, it came in at an angle like this. And because it came at this angle, it glanced off the wall and saved the U.S. Special Forces. You heard about the five that were wounded. They were back to Germany. That was the five. There was also four British SAS. It buried the entire group alive, nine guys. And the Northern Line and the Special Forces here, they rushed to this position and dug these guys out and saved them. The British didn't admit their casualties there. They admitted four casualties from the Tora Bora area on the same day, but we watched them carry four British guys out of there, so we think they didn't want to do it as a friendly fire, and that's just what they did. Um, but there's been a bunch of scenarios like, for, I, one of the pilots of the Army told me that if the plane doesn't come in within a 30 degree path of the laser, it will search for the laser, but it can't tell the end point from the origination point. And it often it may have found the origination point. I'm not sure. Another person said that they could have obviously punched in the wrong coordinates, their own coordinates. But, you know, I don't know. I mean, gosh, this happens a lot, it seems like. I mean, the hard two weeks after this happened, 
three U.S. servicemen were killed or bombed. The same thing happened. It happened, uh, I think it happened in Kuwait, it happened in Bosnia. This is a big bomb, it's a 2,000 pound J-down. And the, yeah, you saw the blast. It was intended to hit the pink house, it would have penetrated the pink house, wiping out the cell structure below, and that would have been the end of John Walker and all of them. That's kind of what they were going for, frankly. But the opposite occurred. Because it hit here, it killed about 20 north, it's hard to say. Some northern lines guys say it killed 10, some say it killed 40. We started looking at the guys that we had been around all morning, and a lot of them didn't come back. So definitely 10, 15, 20 had been killed or wounded. The guys in the tank that served the ripping part just ripped the guys in half, basically. They were, they were part of them were there. Um, it took the wind out of the sail, and the fight was over for the northern lines on Monday. And they were stressed out the the U.S. They didn't want any U.S. They didn't want the U.S. to help. They're like, enough, enough. That was the first of what was going to be three strikes, and that was the last strike of the day. All the northern lines that were in the northeast tower, and everywhere, they scurried out of the northeast tower and got on the outside. They were afraid the U.S. was going to bomb them again. So it's really, you know, you have to think if you're a Taliban, you must have been kind of amusing. Because they're sitting there. There was no fire coming down the Taliban now for like four to six hours after the bomb strike. So it took that long to get the northern lines operational again. The U.S. had to get their evac they had to evacuate their wounded. The U.S. also had to strike a deal to, to help out again. And this is very much, this is a Northern Alliance battle. If anybody thinks that the U.S. is calling all the shots, on, these, on, the, on the micro level, on the tactical level, it's just not the case. Right after the bomb hit, I showed Special Forces. They asked me like, if we could review the footage because there was so much depth, they couldn't tell where the bomb hit. So I showed them where the bomb hit, and they're like, oh, gosh, you know, they ran off to get their wounded. Later in the evening, I was still around there, and I was over here by the wall, and they showed up the same guys. And we started talking again. They were Green Berets. And uh, they said, you know, it was kind of funny. They said, hey, you know what? We never get to see ourselves on film. Is there any way, when this is over, we could redeploy it? Can we get a copy of the video? There's <laughs> a lot of cool stuff we can do to see it. And I said, yeah, no problem. So we started exchanging information. And I said, you know, but you're going to be on CBS tomorrow because I sent them the footage to CBS. And they said, oh, no way, that's amazing. I'm going to tell my wife, so we got the satellite phone out. And they started calling my wife. <laughs> <laughs> they said, oh, call, call dad, call grandpa. And uh, it was kind of cool. And then they traded some information with me. They said, hey, whatever you do tonight, don't be inside the fort. I'm like, oh, really? Okay. Um, but they said, the be nearby, you'll get a show you'll never forget. I said, so you're going to use AC-130 gunships for comic books? And I said, well, I can't really tell you that. And the other guy just goes, <laughs> 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 and, uh, it was very, very interesting. Um, my camera was completely trashed for the day. I was out of tape stock, I was out of batteries. And it was getting dark, and as a rule at camp, and just don't travel after dark anywhere. It's just not safe, even in liberated areas. And in fact, we went into this, we had a hard time getting to, you know, our cab obviously was not there. So we walked a bit and found a car and got a ride back to the city. I started changing out. I didn't think anybody drives back. So I called the commander, and I had, I had him and his men show up. And I said, listen, I'll pay $500 each if it will just drop us off at the fort. And I'll see them. I said, well, you're going to have to stay. I'll sleep in the ditch. There's some ditches here. So I could put my camera here and just sleep in the sleep there for the night. You know, you shuttle out in the morning so I could also hide. And they said, there's no way. They said, we control the town and the fort, but we do not control the road between the town and the fort. It's only 10 miles. I said, okay, wait. Highly liberated area. For one, you don't even control the fort. You control half the fort. <laughs> but you can't even drive 10 miles here, and your commander with your guys is just absolutely not too dangerous. And that was very revealing for me, because this is a Northern Alliance area, considered safe. If they won't travel after dark, there's no reason for Westerners to travel after dark. Uh, they just don't do it. And we tried everything. I could not get out that fortress that night. So I climbed up to this, uh, there was a hotel, and I went up to the top, what they call it a hotel. It was a tall building. And I went up to the top, and you could see the AC-130 gunship pound that place, and it was circle. I don't know if anybody knows these things. It's basically a big cargo plane that has the C-130 fit with a variety of wide arsenal, a wide range of weapons. And you'll notice in the video there's a spot where they put a pan, you see the top of all the trees are cut off. Because that's an AC-130 gunship. From about 10 in the evening to about 5 in the morning, it circled. And it would just pour down fire on the southern compound. I mean, it's basically just <coughs> blanketing the entire thing with uh, machine gun fire and um, Get some cannon fire, and there were three AC-130 gunships, you know, stationed in Uzbekistan. It's kind of hard to tell because they had all three on station. Obviously, one could not fly that pattern all night long, so I think they located it out. I again, I thought the battle was over. Nobody can live through that. 
I'll go tomorrow and get an aftermath story. Got there Tuesday morning. I think all the Taliban, I don't think it killed a single Taliban. I think they all went down to the cells and, and just waited the whole thing out. What it did do is it blew up the ammunition dumps here, and here, and here. It hit those and blew those up. And, and the, the battle was still very much on. We got there in the morning, and the northern lines were getting ready to assault. And their plan this time was to go in from the east and from the west, fight their way through to the windows here. It's very much an urban warfare environment here. They had to fight their way through here into this passageway. Once they took this area, they are going to try to get some guys to jump over the top, me, take the high ground around here, and then clear the courtyard. Um, special Forces arrived, 17. They had a one vehicle fit with a stretcher. We assumed to take a stand body out when they found it, or anybody else who got wounded. They set up a command tower here with the option of calling an airstrike, playing circle over the fortress all day long. No airstrikes were called in, but you just had the feeling it was there just in case. When they got into the gate, we were there with the Northern Alliance commander. The one Delta guy goes, ah, we have sheep in the compound. And I was out, they could be out. I said, hey, I didn't appreciate being called sheep, but they didn't want to have kids come on to be on film, as you can imagine, on camera. So after throwing me out, I went around here, which turned out to be better for me anyway. And I found a, a spot on the wall that I could jump over, and I jumped over and died. And you see, in a lot of the footage, was that courtyard battle, and all those, you know, we were filming from that sort of lift. And what happened was the Taliban had been cleared out of this side, but they had not been cleared out of this side. And it was very interesting. I mean, it was a really interesting battle to watch the Northern Alliance operate. It was, there was no special forces. It was just, you know, just move, 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 move. You know, uh, Taliban fire, they strike back, they retreat, hit and run, hit and run. Uh, it took two or three hours to clear a path down to here and so they felt like they had the Taliban put out of this section here. And I followed the first guys down. And then I jumped around to the pink house. And I got right here, and that's where that guy, he's in the film, where he's looking at the dead body. The guy wasn't dead, he was still breathing. And what was bugging me about it, they kept throwing rocks on the guy's head. And I thought, well, you know, if you're going to try to throw him out of misery, just kill him. So, I mean, shoot him if that's what your goal is. And the guy was really messed up. It was weird to me that he kept throwing rocks at his head. And it was sad, actually. That was the only time the battle I got really sad. But, um, what I hadn't realized at the time was how many Taliban were in the basement. And so we were on the first floor, and they were shooting up to the vents. And so we were shooting down. We, the guys were shooting down. And we were careful not to walk up the vents. And then at that moment, some Taliban jumped out of a place right here, four guys, and they just spray fire. And you saw the guys in the film running up the hill. They were all retreating. And the four, the four Northern Lions guys whom I was with, I turned around, and they were gone. And I was standing here by myself with my friend Alex and time and we this is ridiculous because you should hold your position. We're stuck here. We've got Taliban in the basement. Four Taliban are making a run for it. They're on this side of the house. All the Northern Lions guys are up on the walls again and we're by ourselves just with cameras. And it was a really bad, it really annoyed me. Um, we, had to, we had to get out of there. I mean, it was crazy. So the, I thought the... the it was like the lesser of two evils. What do you do? We hit. We just ran across to fill the bodies this way using the house as a screen. We couldn't go this way. We got right into the line of fire. Both fired because the northern lines were just wildly shooting this direction. Taliban was wildly shooting this direction. We were just hiding here at the corner. And I was afraid the Taliban would come out of the basement and then we would be done for. So we ran across this, this way and the northern lines guy was with us. Well, he were, took off first. They had all run. But the guy got shot in the leg doing it. So we actually caught up to him in the hallway. But he got shot in the leg about right here. We got back around the, the northern parap I mean, parapet here to the south to the men. It took another three hours to clear the courtyard again, all because four Taliban jumped out. We saw in the footage the guy shooting into the hole, the foxhole. There were three Taliban in there, and they had sort of been hiding the whole day, and all of a sudden the northern lines got to go down. They just opened fire and killed a bunch more. And it took 30 minutes to clear that hole. It was interesting to watch the northern lines operate. You saw the part where the guy's taking the shoes. You know, battlefield recovery is a big thing in, in many parts of the world. Here, I don't know, individual level is key because these guys had these little rubber slip on, but some of them didn't have shoes at all. And so the Taliban, for some reason, all had high top tennis shoes. I'm not really sure why. But they were much better dressed. And so what they do is they fight their way down here, and they get to the first body, and they strip the body, and it cause the advance to always stall. And the Northern Alliance commanders were very frustrated at this. And the one guy, Mohammed Akbar, he had a big stick, and he was cheating his guys. Constantly to move them forward. 
it's not like the military that we think of today, where there's orders given and you follow through and you know there's good command and control, or if you get taken by surprise, you hold your position, you don't all just run away. Um, so I thought it was interesting. The battle never really ended until the tank was brought in here because the, the, the foot soldiers decided they didn't want to deal with this anymore. And it began pounding shot after shot into the stables. And that was it. Tuesday night, the battle kind of ended. There was still an idea, still the idea there were a few Taliban in the basement, nobody knew for sure. We went home, we looked to clean the camera out again. We arrived the next day, Wednesday morning. General Dostum, who this is his area, this is his fort, he wasn't even here during the, he wasn't here during the entire uh, episode. He was in Kunduz, participating in the land grab of former Taliban holdings. He was more interested in putting his flag down there and grabbing more territory for his element of the Northern Alliance. He arrives Wednesday morning. He walks all over the ground. We walk all over the ground, start trying to count bodies. I look through the weapons storage facilities. I want to sort of see what was left. You can see the, the base plate for the mortars in the film. Uh, there's quite a lot of, they have, they're pretty well armed, the Taliban. In fact, initially they were better armed than the Northern Alliance starting at once they broke into these weapons storage facilities. Thursday, the Red, the Red Cross makes it, there's so much unexploded ordnance you wouldn't believe how many like mortars are sticking half out of the ground. And I mean, it was everywhere. You couldn't walk in without stepping over a body or some unexploded ground. And so the Red Cross made a deal with local health officials. They would not remove any of the bodies off the field. That would have locals would do that. And they'd bring them out to a collection point out here somewhere in the fortress. While they're collecting bodies, Three health officials go down to the down to the basement and they get shot in the stairwell. One guy tumbled down the stairs. The other two get shot, one's in the arm, one's in the shoulder. They, they, they hustle out of there. And then we realize, hey, there's Taliban still in the basement and they're willing to fight. This was so ridiculous. They took these rockets, these RPG warheads, and they were taking the warheads off and throwing them down the bank to try to blow the Taliban up. They didn't, I never heard them once say, hey, we'd like to surrender with you, consider fighting, you know, anything. But the, you can hear the rockets going, and then boom. And one just you could hear it fizzing around sh- and then it shot out another window there. <laughs> and it went out of the fortress and hit in the neighborhood. And it hit on like some house, like two blocks away. So it was amazing. And they really never cleared it until Friday, as you probably know from the story, they started pumping water from a fire truck into the uh, basement. Saturday, that's when John Walker and 85 Taliban came out. Nobody had any idea there was that many Taliban down there. And uh, they basically said they, they went out. They, they left because they were, well, the wounded they couldn't walk or sit. They were drowning, and the rest were freezing cold. It was pretty cold over there. And that's the story. That's called a junkie. Uh, when I got back to London, about two weeks after it, I heard, kept hearing massacre, 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 uh, you know, shame on the U.S. and shame on the Northern Alliance partners. And I did uh, a couple of briefings and some talks, some radio shows and things, and we said, you know, I, don't, I didn't see it that way. And part of the argument was, I mean, someone said, well, it's an issue of proportionality. And I said, well, what do you mean? They said, well, it's not fair that 200 die and only one, 250 Taliban die and one American die. And I said, well, I beg to differ. If you're the army, you don't want to lose anybody. You want to kill as many as possible or incapacitate them. So I don't believe that qualifies as a massacre. Plus, the ultimate responsibility of this, thing, this whole episode, I think, goes to General Dilson. He was more interested in capturing land than Kunduz. He was happy they'd already taken the Zarg back in power. They never searched these guys adequately. I mean, the fact that so many of them had grenades hidden on them, I mean, they tied them to their crotch, they tied them under their arms, places where they could hide them. And there's like, no one like, just would not physically pat these guys down. And I talked to special forces there, and they said, it's a fiasco. They said, we are so careful, we just have to stand off all the way ready to fire, because we don't know who's going to jump out or who's going to have a grenade. But we don't handle two of them our mandate, so it's their deal. They didn't search them. And this whole thing, I think, and a couple other aspects, because of Dostrum's reputation as a butcher, and these are foreign Taliban, and it's been widely publicized that foreign Taliban have no place to go. You know, when this war started, they said there were 44,000 Taliban. I mean, how many have been killed or captured or have been incapacitated? Not even half that many, because in Afghanistan, you can be Taliban today and Northern Alliance tomorrow. Two of the commanders in that fortress, and one of the guy in my video was Taliban three weeks earlier. He just traded sides. He just kept his gun. And I asked him, I said, you know, this doesn't make any sense to me. How can you become like an older man? Ah, oh, the guys knew me. I'm from this area. You know, I wasn't really Taliban. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're a local Afghan, you're off the hook in many respects. But if you're a foreigner, if you're Pakistani, a Chechen, mm-hmm. you're someone from Yemen, an Australian, a Brit, or you, uh, you're not, you know, like John Walker, you're not going to settle in Afghanistan when the war's over, plow some field or anything. You're going to go back, and that's who the U.S. is after. 
and that's when the Northern Alliance and the opposition forces, they want to get rid of these guys. There were not enough assurances made to these prisoners, in my opinion. They really, really believed they were going to be led to the fortress and massacre. When John Walker said that the guys were crying when they were coming out that Sunday morning before anything happened, they thought they were being led to the slaughter, I totally believe them. You look at Wilson's reputation, you look at the fact that 600 Pakistanis were murdered or killed or massacred, no one saw it. But in the, in the school two weeks earlier, start adding things up, you're a foreigner in a foreign place, you're disarmed, and you're with one of the biggest butchers of the whole conflict. You're, you, you just assume, I really do think they thought they were going to be executed. It's an ugly episode. Uh, ironically, it could produce in a war that really that has no visible visible villain for heroes. You're going to get John Walker and Span, and they might outlive this war as it's part of you know, the notoriety anyway. Um, I know we're kind of running out of time. Are there any questions? May I also open up some questions? Let's do this. I know quite a few of the students will have a one o'clock class, so let's break the formal part of the presentation. Okay. Invite those who have a little more time to just come on up front and ask you some questions. Oh, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we can show it again. We'll show it again, right? Whenever that group goes. Yeah, it's cool. We'll show it and then we can talk about it. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh. Can someone start that? Yeah. That area, like a very large area, like what's the kind of size? It's about, my best guess is about 600 meters, maybe square. From the north to the south. North to the south, with the dividing wall in the middle. And I'll point that out here and explain it a little bit more. Oh. 
So which one? We were watching in which which side is this the Taliban? Who's the speaker? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I all the things you're seeing of the Northern Alliance firing. Um, I could see Taliban, but literally I could not get my camera around fast enough. I mean, they were not staying in the open for very long because they were under a lot of heavy fire. Yeah. Yeah, you know what happened is uh, that's where Dosan had his cavalry. They just slaughtered the horses. There were horse carcasses there everywhere. But see, that was the whole thing. At first, it's thought, oh, we'll starve them out. I mean, a lot of rumors, rumors were so rampant. When we first got there, we heard that the journalists antagonized them and started the revolt. It wasn't journalists. It was those two CIA guys. But they thought they were journalists because they were snapping pictures and trying to interview them. But they were interrogating them, which was really, really terrible interrogation tactics. Terrible. I mean, you usually separate. You should separate them from the group. Let's think if you were John Walker. You walk to a group. All your guys are sitting over there. You're sitting on here. If you start talking, you're dead and you go back in the line. But they know you're, the Taliban knew he was an American. Once Span finds out, I mean, they can just assume that he tells Span in English. Walker played it pretty cool, in my opinion. I'm not justifying anything he did, but he didn't say a word, and I don't think he should have, because he would have walked right back to a shot him in that group, and he would have been killed either there or in his cell that night. I mean, I've never seen that before. And, uh, of course, the army, there are army people coming out now, and it really does look like they the CIA. You know, there's a rivalry there as well. But it was also very strange to me that the CIA was there, just two guys without any backup whatsoever. And they didn't even know. I have the transcripts of Dave talking to the German satellite phone. He's talking to Florida, and he's going, well, there are guys in town here, but I'm not sure where they are or who they are. I mean, did no. Oh. oh, sorry. I can't remember what I was going to say. Let's start the film, and I'll try to narrate as much as I can. Can someone there just push play, and it should just pick it right up? This is the northeast section, the northeast tower of the fortress, and this is the road on the north. On the north. This is kind of a prep. The Northern Alliance had uh, hundreds of these. Players. Yeah, they're in here. These are reinforcements arriving. Okay, here's one of them. That's a tree. That's, in the north. That's where I was just hiding. Those stupid rockets are zipping over our head. So we came in from the east now. There's the trees way off in the distance there. It's cotton fields, yeah. I have no idea what they're saying. It just sounded interesting to me to uh, listen to these things. This is a tank on the northeast tower before it's hit. This is another tank that's brought in. Yeah, Russian T-55 series in the 1950s. Um, well, Northern Lions guys. Actually, just like I said, it's a little bit out of context. Those two guys were down by the pink house, supposedly my escort down there, and they're the ones that ran away. This guy has a great face. I love it. He used to make... He's just very bizarre. <laughs> So these are the guys along the southern end, outside the fortress, peering into the wall, you know, peering down in there, trying to get a shot off. A guy next to him, we were watching, got shot right through the eye, and uh, he tumbled all the way down. And we ran over to him, and uh, it really weird. It creased his skull and came out here. It didn't go all the way through, and he got up. Um, they took him to the hospital. I, I can't. I don't. I didn't think he'd live, but apparently he is still alive, minus the eye. This guy's Taliban, but he's not Taliban now. He was three weeks ago. That's what the guy's talking about. Now he's Northern Alliance commander in charge of the Northeast Tower. Very, very funny. Very kick that guy. Ah, yeah, he's Taliban, but no one's really Taliban. Mm, very few. I did until I went over the wall on the last day, and they said, forget that. So I was on my own. This is the Northeast Tower. Looking into these trees, 
along the dividing wall, the Taliban are all in there, you know, using the trees as cover and then using the windows to fire from. Another rocket zipping over. You can hear the bullets. There's a lot of bullets. I mean, there's a lot of lead flying around. That's the dividing wall there. Yeah. This is fighting down to the southern court. Well, side, the other side. It's quite a big fortress, actually. I'm trying to climb over the wall, so I run through the field. And... The guy doesn't even aim. But I've got this to take on about seven, eight minutes on film. They cannot get these guys. They fire grenades, they go way over. They were very big. This is one of those. Yeah. Oh, what happened? We lost our light. For me, in an interesting way. Hey, Father, Oh, we're on again. Hold on. That's the only wounded Taliban I saw taken out alive. He's from Tajikistan. There's the pink house down below. There's the fill of the bodies. There's the guy with the stick. There's the stick. He's beating these guys with the stick. These guys are, okay, the guy in the blue, SAS, British SAS. The, the U.S. Army wore uh, uniforms, the British wore jeans, blue sweatshirts, Palestinian like scarves. That was it. This is 10th Mountain. These four guys are 10th Mountain Division. These are the Green Braves. The Green Braves are really funny. They're going, yeah, these young guys, man, they can't even shave. Because these, these guys were growing their hair out long, and they had beards, and... The uh, Tenth Mountain didn't, they said, but it really was an issue because they couldn't shave anyway. It was a joke, I guess. Uh, See, there's the pink house there. There's the dividing wall. See that rocket that just was fired? Yeah, this is the bomb that hit the Northeast Tower. And so we're diving behind this wall, and this Special Forces guy right here that dove down in front of me, he's the one who I reviewed the footage with him so they could see where it hit. That was absolutely wrong. He's the bus. And so the Northern Alliance basically says that's it, no more strikes. So they call the strikes off. That's Olam Razum, one of the chief advisors. That's the tank. I mean, the beauty, I mean, the thing about Afghanistan, everything's made out of dirt, right? So it really just moves dirt around. Okay, there's looking through the breach. That's where, that looking into the south compound, that's why this area's so shot up, because everyone's sort of firing into there and firing out to there. Span is somewhere out in there. These guys, these are actually, they'd come out, there's a, there's a Arab of some sort. There's a pink house again. 
stealing the tennis shoes and swapping out from your little rubber slippers. That's this is just the uh, the way in between. I no, I mean it's pretty much. You can see there's really no. I, you know, someone told me, oh, you'll look for the same kind of turbans. Yeah, look at there's six different turbans on six different guys there. All right, mortar base plates here, recoilless rifles. This is stuff the Taliban were able to get to. Uh, I didn't know what these were. The, the guys in the army think tank said that they thought it were Bangalore torpedoes, which haven't been used in a long time. This uh, this is part of Dos, General Dostum's entourage arriving on Wednesday. See how the trees are all cut? All that's been cut down by the AC-130 gunships. There's the stables there. The Taliban had lots of places to hide, and it was, it was almost like a, more of an urban war fighting setting. These were from the bomb, U.S. bomb strikes on the first day. But they weren't big bombs. They were just uh, tactics, you know, like, uh, I'm not sure exactly what they fired. They had nine of them, though, nine strikes. All this tree stuff knocked down from bullet fire. And these guns, man, they're from 1940s, 1950s. Yeah. World War II issue. But it's it. they could just take them. They could just take the guns and it's theirs. You know? This guy was great. He's a Hazara, an ethnic Hazara. His name's Ali Sarwar. And then he's looking from the outside of the fortress. So, were there any, any other questions or? Yeah. Fear factor. Oh, fear factor. Okay. <clears throat> well, the Northern Alliance guys seem pretty, uh, uh, pretty fearful. They're, they, whenever we came across a dead body, they would always point to it and say Chechen. And the Chechens have a very fierce reputation in that part of the world. And I don't know if they actually knew they were Chechen or not, but they wanted you to believe it was a Chechen. I mean, they, there was a healthy respect for the Taliban in this case. For me, in many ways, well, I have mixed feelings about it. It didn't feel near as dangerous as Chechnya to me, but at the same time, once you jump in and run the inside of the fort, there was, I've never been in that intense of a firefight before with enough lead flying back and forth. That was the most intense, but it, it just it felt okay. It just felt okay to be there. I mean, you had to take precautions. Um, but I definitely thought about it. I thought about it when I was stranded at the pink house without a gun. I'm not saying I wanted a gun, but I didn't have any way to cover myself, and I didn't, you know, Taliban were making a break for it. And that, that part was a bit disturbing. And running across the field, like 50 yards, totally in the open, was not what I wanted to do either. But other than that, it, you know, it, it felt okay, I guess. I mean, I'm not saying I wasn't afraid. I was always cautious, but... I said I was more afraid and more scared in different parts of the world, primarily Chechnya. And Chechnya, the thing about the battle, it's, it's like it was, it was the most neatly contained battle. It's all within these walls in an area of 600 square meters. And so in a way, you, had a, you knew where your safety net was. If somehow you could get over the wall and just tumble down the outside, you could relax. I mean, literally, you could have lunch, sit in the lawn chair, do whatever you wanted to do on that outside of the fortress, except for them in the north where that kill zone was. But... Um, in Chechnya and other places, when you're just winding through mountain roads and there's Russians hunting Chechens and there are Chechen groups all over the place, they could be anywhere and death could come from all kinds of places. And that's, that's what I think was the, the uncertainty and not knowing makes me more afraid. I mean, that's, that was more fearful to me. So, yes. Well, in my opinion, and what we got from the Northern Alliance people that we talked to is that they said, hey, we gave these Taliban a chance to surrender. They killed 40 of our guys on the very first day, and that's it. It's to the knife. We're not going to, you know, we're going we're gonna to fight, fight this out to the end. And I brought that up, actually, to Ali Jalali, who was a Mujahideen commander who's written a number of books. He lives in D.C. And he said, what's interesting in the Afghan conflict, normally you always give yourself, you give the enemy a back door. And what he meant by that is, that, you know, we have to live here. You can be Mujahideen one day, you can work for the Soviets the next day, then you can be Mujahideen again, then you can be a Taliban, and now you can be a Northern Alliance. That's okay, but it's the foreigners they always close the back door on. They never, you know, they'll fight it out to the last man on that. But they always sort of open up this back door, this is what he felt, for themselves and for other people living there because they have to live with these people. I mean, I don't know how far to take that, except I do know, again, these are foreign Taliban. They didn't like these guys at all. They felt like they were invaders. Right now... The U.S. is in a really good position because we've helped liberate 
uh, they consider the liberation of their country. I mean, it could turn on us very fast. Um, when the errant bomb hit the Northeast Tower and some guys came off that wall and they were shaking their fists at us and they were, the looks of anger that we got from those guys, that was the only time I thought, you know, we could be lynched right here by the Northern Alliance. I mean, it can turn so fast. Right now we're an invited guest, but we won't be forever, so we'll have to know when we need to get out. But um, these guys, their time was over, and so they, I think we just want to fight that to the end. That's my opinion, also based on what I understood. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, can anyone here talk about the armament on the AC-130? I'm going to get this wrong without a spec sheet. But they have an amazing array of weapons on that. Do you know what they have? I mean, they have like, yeah, they have these two. They have two Gatling guns on it. Um, it's a plane, and it only. It's funny because the plane orbits in a circle because all of its weapons are stuck on one side. So it finds its target, and it just orbits on the. And then it's, all the weapons are along the inside. It orbits around and just shoots. And the first time I've ever saw it in film was in John Wayne's film, The Green Berets, and they called it Puff the Magic Dragon. It was developed in Vietnam, actually, to help clear the forest as far as I know because before Agent Orange was the option they would fly the AC-130 gunships and it would cut down all the trees and they figured if they could deforest it they could actually find the Viet Cong uh, it's kind of evolved into even a more deadly killing weapon it's a very slow platform it doesn't fly very high and you have to have total air su superiority to even operate it because it has no defense systems on it at all it's a very slow plane but it can put down, like, you can put, you know, the size of a football field, you can just put a bullet, like, every three inches on a grid. I mean, in every pass, I and mean, they were doing all night long. I watched the passes go for about an hour and a half and finally just went to bed. But, I mean, it just, and then I got up in the morning, they were still doing it. So, this is quite incredible. Oh. I have an idea, prognostication, how Karzai is going to handle somebody like Dostum. I don't. You know, Dostum was given an immediate position. I can't remember what it was, and he rejected it. They gave him a different position. I'm not sure how that's going to sort itself out. I mean, Dostum and some of the other Northern Alliance commanders in the north and in the far west, like Ismail Khan is the Shia uh, leader over Herat, for instance, and then Dostum carries the northern area. They have that buffer, the Hindu Kush, the mountains, very much, it seems to me that Afghanistan is still pretty much a divided like a north and a south because you have this massive mountain range in the middle. I think as long as Dostum is allowed to act semi-autonomously, it's going to work. I think that at any point in time where Kabul tries to impose their will, their will over General Dostum or, or over Ismail Khan in Herat and put, to, you know, is in the... Within the parameters of maybe state security, military forces, maybe those, you know, then I think it's all it's all going to fall apart. But they might leave Dostum alone for some time because they've got bigger fish to fry and they've got to get that whole Pashtun community and that whole southeastern section under control. I mean, Dostum could probably act with a free hand for probably a couple of years. I think in developing their own army. Uh, yes. Kabul's army. Yeah, as long as until Kabul, I was thinking if Kabul tries to impose that, their military forces on Dostum, I don't believe that'll work for a second. I don't think Dostum will have any of it. I think he'll wipe them out before they cross the pass. Because he's just not going to do it, historically. How well, did you get any sense for the working relationship between the U.S. Special Forces and the British SAS? Not too much. The British SAS were the uh, most unfriendly of the bunch. Um, of course, CIA Dave wasn't too friendly either, but he just lost his friend. And... Uh, you know, I don't know. what is, I, I can only tell you my impression from what I saw. I didn't have a chance to really talk with these guys. The U.S. were fully armed with the M4 and some of the most modern light infantry, I mean, infantry weapons available. And they were in uniform. But yet they drove up in locally rented vans with, like, Arabic writing and Afghan writing and things, which I thought was very interesting because the British came in jeans and sweaters but they arrived in white British military uh, Land Rover vehicles with machine gun mounts. Yet they used the old M16 long barrel M16, which I thought was also very surprising. Um, they just, you know, they seem to be working. They seem to work fine as a unit. That's all I can say. They they came together, though they did drive their own vehicles. They they stayed in the same camp or base. The base for the special forces in Mazar-e Sharif, if anyone's going to go there, is uh, the Turkish school. You could drive right up to the Turkish school and get out and talk to the guys and at the guard, guarded by 10th Mountain Division. But within that compound are the British SAS and all the different elements of the U.S., except possibly the CIA 
might be someplace else because based on the transcripts from the telephone conversations which we trans which we listened to it appeared that Dave had no idea where the special forces were which I thought was really remarkable so also they would enter the fortress just with sidearms <coughs> No, you're very much your own guy. The there's another safety net though. I is that if you do get wounded in that battle, for instance, I knew I could go right to the special forces and I could be, uh, their medic would take care of me and probably get me out if it was life threatening. Um, the special forces CIA they do not want to talk to you at all, but. It's just a general policy. I mean, in the occasion like this case, I had something they needed. They, I definitely wanted information from them. I shared footage of the bomb strike. They shared please stay out of the fortress type information so I didn't get gunned down by the AC-130 gunships, which was nice. Um, but for the most part, they like to work in secrecy, and they don't, you don't have anything to do with them at all. And you don't know. I'm not sure if you want to get too close to them, actually, because if you appear to be too close you know, I think a lot of people, just, I mean, a lot of people on the ground, I know there were people in the French media, of course, that thought I was CIA, and they kept talking about it all the time. I said, you know, that's like a dangerous game to play out here. You can get somebody killed. But they just go, well, that doesn't make sense to me that somebody will be out here with this camera and just diving in over the wall and doing all this stuff. I'm like, well, that's okay. Sorry. But, you know, so I try to actually stay away. I never even made it. I never attempted to even go to the fortress to visit those guys. I didn't try to interview them. The only contact I had with them was in the battle. And in the heat of the battle, you can probably get closer than you would otherwise because you kind of, other things have sort of, <clears throat> other issues are forgotten. I really believe that. I was thrown out of the fortress four times in three days. Uh, but you just keep finding another way in. And once you got right down where the battle was the, the heaviest, down in the courtyard, we were getting yelled at, and I don't think they wanted us there, but what were they going to do? Take the time out to throw us out? You just, you know, I didn't understand what they were saying. It's not in my head and kept going forward. You can get away with it then, so. So as a, as a journalist, when you're in there, is it, I guess you just kind of play neutrality like you were, you were talking about, but how has it been that you don't kind of start picking sides or mm. look to start helping people out? Huh? You know, we had this panel discussion at Sundance Film Festival two weeks ago. We, we showed this clip for a thing, uh, panel called Covering War and Film. And the idea of neutrality and subjective versus objective came up. And for one, I believe that in all the really bad places, there's no such thing as objective. I don't even know if there's a such thing as objective anyway. Excuse me. But in Chechnya, for instance, we went in over the mountains with Chechen rebels, you know, that are being hunted by the Russian and by other Chechen groups. There was a general assumption that had we gotten any sort of problems or a firefight that we would help out. And absolutely, we were prepared to help out because they're not going to, we couldn't say we're journalists or whatever, let us go. I mean, it's like the survival of the group is at stake and you fight, you help. You just have to be prepared to help. In this situation as well, I mean, you're with the Northern Alliance. I mean, yeah, it would have been nice to get something with the Taliban. I mean, as a, from a journalist's point of view, if you had like an interview with the Taliban, but you're in the middle of a battle. <clears throat> it's also kind of understood that if things go down, I mean, you do whatever it is also you know, for self-preservation. By the pink house, honestly, if there was two or three guys there with guns, we would have stayed by that pink house. The Taliban would have come out and rushed us. I would have done everything I could have to stay alive, just basically, if it meant, you know, engaging. And I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I can't say. But, yeah, there's no real neutrality. I don't believe that for a second. I think the only way you can be neutral in these situations, and in Chechnya we found this, too, and I'll keep referring back to Chechnya, sorry. We went in with a group that was so hated by the Russians and so... You know, there was just enough of a, this guy was enough of a figure that we were safe on one hand because we were with him, but we were also targeted on the other hand. The only way to actually go to the other side was to completely leave the situation, go back a couple months later to another area and find another group. You couldn't really just cross sides from one group to the other. We certainly weren't going to cross sides from the Northern Alliance to the Taliban in this case either. So there really was no, I mean, so you're really not neutral. I don't believe that at all. But you can just get that story. You can then try to go get another story. Maybe two months later. I mean, we first tried to go in to find the Taliban. I mean, I really wanted to be at the Taliban in Mazar as they were being attacked by the uh, by Dostum, and that's what we were trying to arrange was to get into Mazar Sharif first before the, the Northern Alliance got there. Our biggest fear was if we did get in, we probably have more problems with U.S. airstrikes than Dostum's group. But we didn't get in either. Just continue on that same idea. So then you're 
unarmed. Yes. Mm -hmm. I've never carried a weapon uh, in those situations. Like in different places, the groups will point out that there's an extra gun, and I don't pick it up, but I know it's kind of for me if we need it. And in this case, in this battle, uh, there was a lot of I mean, stuff laying around in most cases. The only time I didn't see anything was by the pink house. Um, you know, would I use it if I had to? I don't know. I hope I don't have to. But. Well, the journalists, yeah, they get kind of weird about that. You know, like when I guess when I was out there, Geraldo had claimed that he was packing heat and was going to solve America's problems for him, you know. And the journalist community just went nuts on it. They just hated it so much because they felt that it puts them in the line of fire. That's a big debate right now in the journalist uh, community. Does it really put you in the line of fire? I don't know. War has changed. This is not a war of fronts where journalists or medics are given any sort of uh, right to live. I mean, collateral damage, the killing of women and children, is common in most of the conflicts you see around the world, so why would a journalist be spared? It's a big debate. Some journalists carry guns. I don't know. He's had to sort of, I think it's situational. Every situation is probably different. Back in the back, yeah. Yeah, I did not wear a vest. Most of the most of the other journalists in the area did wear a vest, which is funny because no one else was in the fortress either. But Alex and I from Time Magazine, we did not wear one. We uh, probably should have, but they are kind of clunky. If you put the plates in them, they become heavier. We have a new. We actually have some new ones. We're getting actually today. They should have been arrived at the uh, house today. There's some government issue vests, and they're a little bit lighter, with still the same stopping power supposedly. I take them with me, but sometimes I wear them, sometimes I don't. It's probably sloppy, but it's heavy, you know. And and they don't stop around. They'll stop a fragment or shrapnel. I mean, I had shrapnel bounce off me two or three times in this um, place, and I was very thankful they didn't come at a trajectory or a speed that would have embedded itself in me. It hit my leg, hit my boot, didn't hit me in the face or the eye, didn't drop down my collar and burn me. I mean, there was a lot of shrapnel flying around for mortar and rocket fire. Um, in that case, it probably would have been good to have a jacket because it would definitely deflect anything that came at you at a speed which, which, with which it would embed itself. Hey, Paul. Uh, there's a report of uh, some uh, Chinese, uh, Xinjiang, Western Turkish types over in there with Taliban others. Have you, heard, have you ever seen anything about that? You know, I didn't see... Well, you know, the thing is, I walked around the, the battlefield and I looked at hundreds of dead bodies and I couldn't tell <laughs> if there was a Wigir in that group or not. There have been some reports that there are Whig years there, and the, and I asked actually some Northern Alliance uh, people, and they said, oh yeah, there are definitely Whig years in that Brigade 55 that was run by Namangandi, the Uzbek, who was the head of the IMU, which has recently been changed. Brigade 55, which was supposed to be a foreign Taliban brigade, has basically been folded or wrapped up and killed off. I mean, I don't know where the remnants are. Some of these guys were thought to have been part of Brigade 55, but the order of battle isn't as clear as it is in Western armies. It's really difficult to say. I didn't see anybody that I could tell. The other thing about it is on the battlefield, everything in Afghanistan is dusty. So everybody's covered in dust, the living and the dead. And in a way, it was nice because it sort of took the edge off of all the dead because it almost looked like a bunch of wax museum figures. They looked unreal. They were innate objects because everybody was coated in this dust. I mean, a lot of those bodies had been laying there since the very first day, Sunday, two days earlier. And after being hit by bombs and rocket fire and AC-130 gunships for five hours, they were just clumps. And that was hard to identify. I'll say one final thing about Span. When they took Span out, the Taliban put a grenade on Span's body and threw a dead Taliban over top of him. And they assumed he would be booby trapped. So what they did was they tied a rope around his ankle and hooked it to the T-55 tank and drug Span completely out of the fortress. It was, it was, you know, not a very nice thing to watch, but they did that so all the explosive devices that might have been put between his legs or his armpit or here or any place would actually fall off him and not kill another American trying to uh, take his body. So. What are your plans? Oh, uh, we are actually talking to, talk, we're thinking about going back into Afghanistan in the next few weeks. We're trying to determine exactly is what it is we want to go and cover. And we're also looking at the Philippines, and we're looking in part, uh, parts of Africa, but we're just not sure how the war is going to play itself out. Unfortunately, for the American public, and we talked a lot about this at, the, uh, at Fort Leavenworth a couple of weeks ago, they asked me, what can we do 
to make better relations between the military and the journalist pool. And I said, well, the biggest problem in this war is that the Taliban gave us a convenient enemy with hard targets. In a way, it was almost like going back to World War II. We've got to take this city, this city, this city, this city, and here's the enemy. And they drive Toyotas instead of tanks, but they're there, and these vehicles. Once the Taliban were wrapped up, we got to the real war, which is hunting al-Qaeda and hunting these terrorist cells. Much more difficult. They don't stay in fixed or hard targets. They don't stay in big groups. It's a series of manhunts. This could go on world worldwide in, what, dozens of countries. And so it's going to be a very difficult war, I think, to cover. And it'll be a very difficult war to mobilize public opinion the longer the war continues because you can't show any victories. I mean, you really can't. I mean, they've basically, they're not going to let special forces be photographed. They're not going to let them be filmed. They're not going to let them go on camera. You're going to have Pentagon spokespeople saying, we got so-and-so. And that's the U.S. public probably isn't going to buy it for very long. So it's going to be a hard war, I think, to, to cover. So I'm not sure what we're going to do, but it also dictates kind of like what, what our future is, too. Well, yeah. You know, I did some stuff for, well, I worked for CBS on this particular occasion, and I'm going in to meet with them on Friday again. I had a friend in the London Bureau, and what had happened is I told them where I was going. They said, we're not sending anybody there. And I said, well, you should. They said, okay, we'll send you. I mean, you go and spot for us. And I said, okay, give me a sat phone. So they gave me their sat phone. But they didn't want me to shoot anything for them. They just, thought, they just said, if anything interesting happens, call us and we'll zip the crew in. Because they were down in the other areas of focus, Kabul, Bagram, Airfield, things like that. When this battle happened and I sent the footage, I said, I, well, I called them. I said, you know what, you, gotta, you should look at this. You might be interested. And I got a really crash course lesson in satellite feeds because I didn't know anything about feeding anything. I didn't know anything about it at all. So I had to have some help and, you know, get it all figured out and, you know, how to do it. And I sent the footage and they said, whoa, this is the first combat footage we've actually seen from the entire war. So then they set up regular feeds every night. So I was shooting the fort all day and I'd go out that night, try to piece a little story together and send them 45 minutes worth of footage. And then they'd run it. They ran on morning and evening news during the week. But that's been the only real affiliation. We like to stay independent because the other thing is, if you have a file deadline, you have to leave wherever you're at. So if the story's breaking around you and you got live news going on at 5.30 U.S. time, you got to be there. And I don't like being affiliated to the point where I'm committed to being at some stupid feed point every night because that's not how the war goes. In every case, every situation, I mean, if, if it works out, great. This particular case, it worked out because the fort's 10 miles down the road, too, too dangerous to travel after dark. So you would want to be back in the fort, I mean, back in the city. Then I could walk over to the hotel where the set up the feed satellite, the feed system, the feed site. It worked out in this case. But in most cases, I don't really want to be tied down to that sort of thing. And I would actually refuse to do so because, I mean, I don't know. It's just, it's just difficult. And I saw this. It hampered Fox. It hampered CNN. hampered all these guys. They had to always be there for this feed, this feed, this feed. They could only go on the field for two hours and have to come back. So. Uh, funding over the years has come from a variety of sources. Uh, CBS, actually, we did okay with CBS, this, but that was on the back end. We're doing something for MSNBC right now, a program about this battle. Um, so a lot of it's back end. Sometimes you get a, a grant. I've been a MacArthur Regional Security or Regional Fellowship awardee in the past for my work down in the Republic of Georgia on the Chechen border. So it can come from many different sources. We sell footage to uh, certain groups or certain outlets, and um, I also do a lot of defense writing, a lot of defense writing. I've received from this university? Yeah, I have received. Actually, the Kennedy Center gave us a grant to do a, a, uh, a story about the war in Abkhazia in western Georgia. In fact, it's half finished because the war in Afghanistan just came out of the blue. So Jeff's probably going to want his money back or I'm going to have to finish that film, which we will. But, you know, but sometimes, yeah, I mean, sometimes you, you, if you share an interest with somebody or some group, you do that and try to team up. Um, and so this war, frankly, yes, we did. Because, you know, hard news is not something that the U.S. seems to be interested in. And we didn't really have a war that we called our own. And for better or worse, we do now. And we're busier than we've ever been. So, but it's very cyclical. Being a first-hand uh, witness, how active do you think the media presentation is? <laughs> well, all I know is every one of those groups interviewed me at the end of every day. 
to figure out what happened inside that fortress. And I, Alex and I were laughing. Alex wouldn't tell him a thing, the guy from Time, because he was, no way, I'm a writer. i got to write this stuff up. I'm not going to give them everything. Oh, I didn't... I didn't look for it. I didn't see it, but I honestly didn't look for it. I didn't even think it through that far. Um, I felt like if the fog of war applies, it applies to journalists in war as well. I mean, Alex and I were 10, 20 feet apart sometimes, and we saw things completely differently. I was amazed as he wrote up his notes and I wrote up my own. What are you talking about? And it was just interesting. As far as political agenda, the thing that I did notice most of all is when I got to London, everybody wanted me to say, yes, this was a massacre. The Northern Alliance, with the help of the U.S., killed all these poor innocent Taliban. And I said, that is, I don't believe it. I don't believe it at all. I was there. I saw these guys. They detonated grenades. They killed Northern Alliance. They kept doing it. They break free. They killed the you know, CIA guy. I mean, they, they, they instigated. Now, did they have good reason? Again, I definitely think that there weren't enough promises or mechanisms put in place to convince these guys that they were going to be treated safely. In Afghanistan, there's a history of just putting your prisoners in a big container, putting it out in the desert, and locking it, and walking away, and that's it. And I think these guys thought it would be the last stop, this fortress, and so I don't think they had enough assurances, and I think that was the reason, that was the problem here. Um, this said that there were some pieces of identity in the second stage and the guys who Right. <clears throat> You know, the funny thing is about Dave is that everybody's got footage of Dave because he's on German satellite phone going, we have an insurrection here, we need help. And the Germans are filming him because they're like, you want to use our sat phone? We're filming you. And you can hear him arguing back and forth. I don't want to be on camera, I don't want to be on camera. He's probably the most well-known CIA operative in the world right now. So I'm not that concerned about our footage, frankly. Um, there's so much of it out there. I mean, everybody shot him because he was in a jam. I mean, he was by himself with empty weapons when he hit the northern building in that fortress, and he was definitely reliant on a German TV crew to get himself out of that jam. And they filmed him, and they put that stuff out everywhere. Um, the other guys that I filmed, we haven't put them or we haven't cut them into any story yet, but, again, this is kind of a watershed event is that, yeah, here's 17 or 19 guys that show up every day to fight this battle or call in airstrikes. He's just driving up to the fort. He had it happen. I mean, there's a lot of crews outside, like about a mile away from the fort on tripods. And uh, they would watch these guys get out of their vans, and they'd have it on Zoom. And they got a lot of shots of these guys. You know, I asked the Special Forces, because it's more important for me to have some sort of working relationship with the Army, because we do a lot of work for the Army, too. And so I didn't turn my camera on Special Forces until it was clear that two or three other cameras were already on them. And I asked. And I mean, they probably, they said, well, can't help it. You know, we're already being filmed. But I think just, you know, just that was probably a bit helpful. Anyway, I don't know if I have some CIA guy that no one else has seen if I'd put it on the air or not. Probably not. I don't know if there'd be a reason to. But Dave, I mean, come on. He's everywhere. Yeah. If John Walker, the American, if he participated in this uprising as a normal uh, Taliban that you saw being fought against all the time, in your opinion, would he then qualify as a traitor? Or, or what? Yeah. How, how much did he, if he was a normal member, assuming he was an average member of the Taliban mm -hmm. that you saw, how much did he fight against his own country? Well, again, this war was a war of bomb strikes and surrenders and defections. He probably, if he says he didn't fire a shot, at least to the fortress, I would tend to believe him because I think the majority of the 44,000 Taliban never fired a shot. They, some were taken out by airstrikes and the rest conveniently melted in and became Northern Alliance, like within a, you know, a day of their unit being hit and realizing, can't live this life, we're going to die by, you know, by U.S. bombs. So in that, and so most of the Taliban, I don't think, fired any shots. When it comes to the fortress, you know, Walker says that he was being interrogated, then he ran, then the melee broke out, he ran, was shot in the leg, and went down to the uh, basement. That tends to be supported by other Taliban who are also in there, because basically a lot of the guys that were in the basement were wounded. It's hard to say if John Walker fired a shot, if he had anything to do with Span's death directly. I mean, no one will ever know. Dave doesn't even know. I mean, Dave was fighting for his very life, too, and apparently they weren't right next to each other. So it's hard to say, you know, what he did. I mean, there's a number of counts brought up against John Walker, and I actually am not probably qualified to even comment on all the counts. It's going to be interesting to see how they play this one. 
you have a kind of documentary on the war in Yeah, we made one about uh, Shamil Basayef and his sort of warrior clan a few years ago. Is yeah. Available? Yeah. Talk to me afterwards and I can tell you how to get that. Anything else? Any other questions? Hey, thanks for staying extra. So.